ship like? Uh, what was that question, Claude? Uh, you know, like a pastoral intern. Yeah. Uh, trying to figure out what is that like? Let me pause. I don't know. I it's think it's different, different everywhere you go. Yeah, it's, it's different everywhere you go. Um, yeah, that's right. Zoom share. All oh, right. That's the American. In my church, and all they ever had was the Bible. And there's a few that had all kind of stuff. Well, I want to welcome uh, everyone to pastoral ministry uh, for the summer session of 2021. We're going to be um, covering a, a lot of ground uh, in this class uh, related to how we do uh, ministry. But uh, the first thing we're gonna deal with tonight is the syllabus because so much of this learning that's gonna be going on for the next six or seven weeks is going to be uh, self-guided work, um, a number of assignments. So if you have your syllabus in front of you, you can follow along, but I'm presenting it a little bit different on the screen. Namely, uh, several of the key points. Uh, the official name of this class uh, is CLP 1511 Pastoral Ministry. It's three semester hours of credit and consists of 45 hours of classroom instruction. Um, if uh, someone is joining us who hasn't paid tuition, uh, we have a link for doing that. And we have seven three-hour live sessions on Mondays uh, between June 7th and July 26th with no meeting on July 5th. We will be taking the 4th of July holiday. In addition, we'll have 24 one-hour sessions on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays with vacation days built in. Uh, these will be also recorded. They will take place at 8 o'clock in the morning to 8.50 on June 8th through July 22nd. And um, information on the class will be posted at uh, the school website that we have, uh, midvalleyschooloftheology.com. Instead, um, instead of going directly to the links in Google Drive, if I put things there, I will post links on this website. And um, that will be just one thing to remember and uh, that'll make it a little bit easier for everyone. So this course is a study of pastoral ministry with an emphasis on the understanding and nature of pastoral work and pastoral care within the local church setting. We understand that there are other places we do pastoral ministry, institutions and so forth, hospitals, nursing homes, and we will touch to that as well. It's not really different, but we'll also be focusing on the church setting. The topics will include the basis of pastoral ministry and concerns of pastoral ministry along with the tasks of pastoral ministry. We'll do some of the theoretical, but we will move quickly to the very practical. Our course learning outcomes are really five. We would like and, and want and expect to come through the, this class with a well-rounded understanding of pastoral ministry. Well-rounded means it's broad, it's balanced, it's fleshed out. And with a conceptual knowledge of pastoral care in multiple arenas is where are the places that we would do pastoral care? What are the settings? And how do, how do those settings uh, drive the, uh, the differences in how we're doing pastoral care there? We want to develop enhanced skills 
related to the pastoral past. Um, also, number four, the development of ministry desire, aptitude, and competency. And finally, an increased knowledge and practice in developing lifelong learning orientation to ministry. That is, as people in ministry and in pastoral ministry, we become lifetime learners. We're always learning new skills, new ideas, new ways of doing uh, things uh, better and more effectively. These are the required course components uh, for our class. The first three are the basis of pastoral ministry, why and how and what, and what is the, what is the grounding of that? And then the tasks of pastoral ministry, what, are, what is it we really do when we're doing pastoral ministry? And then concerns of pastoral ministry, and then the student will be expected to master certain skills and or minimum content. These will be evaluated through some essential assignments and the student will demonstrate effective growth in three different areas. So the first uh, outcome that we talked about is the basis of pastoral ministry. The sub subjects of that that we'll be looking at are biblical images of the pastor and his work. So when a, a pastor is described in the Bible, uh, what are the images that uh, God shares with us? The second is the person and the character of the pastor himself. The third is what is the nature of pastoral care. What does it mean to offer someone pastoral care? You know, we know what it is to offer medical care or comfort care or some other kinds of care, but what is pastoral care? And then how does the pastor deal with his or her own self-care and family care, strategies for family ministry. Next, we're gonna, let me break down the, uh, the tasks of pastoral ministry. There are four that are really obvious up front. And these are the ones that almost everybody thinks about. You know, if some people think these are the only things that a pastor might do weddings, including some tips for premarital preparation. Some people call it premarital coaching. Some people call it premarital counseling, whatever it is you do. Some pastors offer premarital classes, uh, but whatever it is, it is a, a preparation of a couple for a lifetime of marriage. Second would be funerals. How do you conduct a funeral? And then we include in that grief care, uh, which is an aftercare, you know, uh, for those who have lost loved ones, and terminal care ministry. How do you minister to the dying? The third area, and it's really, it's a little bit difficult to teach uh, remotely, but I think we can. Uh, by showing some video of different ways that people do it, is baptism. And included in that is a, a very, uh, I think, important thing, is when we give instructions to people as a part of their baptism. The fourth is the Lord's Supper, including its theology as well as its practice. These are just some of the tasks that we'll deal with. We won't do a lot of work on preaching, but we will touch to that and teaching. There are some concerns that always arise when we're dealing with the area of pastoral ministry. 
One is ministerial ethics. What are the ethics that govern how we behave as members of clergy? So sometimes we call those clergy ethics or clerical ethics or ministerial ethics or pastoral ethics. Ethics is really the uh, philosophical study of how do you do, what's the right thing to do? Um, what is the uh, proper way of doing things that is morally and ethically and um, biblically and in the sense of Christian ministry correct? Uh, second concern is crisis and caring ministry, including hospital visitation. The pastoral minister is frequently called upon to be with people in a time of crisis. And there are different kinds of crisis. One day when I was um, driving home from or driving back to Fremont, where I pastored, from somewhere else, I heard on the radio that there had been a school bus accident on um, 680, Interstate 680 near, near Fremont. This was in the 1980s. And that the children in the accident that had come from Sacramento or near Sacramento had been taken to Washington Hospital. So I pulled out my badge as a volunteer chaplain at Washington Hospital and drove immediately there. They had been trying to reach all the chaplains. We didn't have cell phones then or pagers. And I immediately checked in and I was immediately asked to go to a very large room where most of the children were and their parents were slowly coming uh, to to retrieve them. Most of them had very minor injuries. They had set up a triage, but there were about five children and a bus driver who had had major serious injuries and one of the children actually died. And so we were asked to stay and just move from place to place and, and find a child or a family or a teacher or someone who would need pastoral care crisis ministry. Uh, just someone to sit with them, to listen to them, to reassure them. So that was one of the really unusual times of pastoral crisis ministry in a hospital setting, very random. Another concern of a pastoral ministry is in the process of counseling, learning how and when to make a referral. That is, you, you have worked with a, a client, a parishioner, uh, an, anyone, whatever you're going to call that person, uh, to the place where you felt like they're problems are beyond your ability to deal with them. Perhaps they need a deeper psychotherapy from a trained uh, psychotherapist. It may be that you feel that they uh, need medication and you need to develop a, a system of resources for referring that person out. I always let people know whenever I would start counseling with them that I might have to refer them, that I would evaluate them and see what kind of help I could give them. But if it, if it looked like it was going to be more long-term or more in-depth that exceeded my skills, I would refer them, but I would continue to be their pastor and stay in touch with them and meet with them uh, to give them spiritual guidance. So when to, when to do that, how to recognize maybe some of the danger signs that um, send up red flags and say, this person uh, really needs a, a licensed counselor or maybe even a psychiatrist or, or maybe even their family doctor. The fourth is leading leaders, something that we, we 
touch on in, in several different classes. Uh, let me go back to number three again. We are getting ready to launch a certificate at Gateway on uh, peer counseling. It'll be four courses. So this is a certificate that, that uh, we've not offered at this level before. It's being developed by Dr. Debbie Steele, who is a, um, who is a, runs the uh, counseling uh, program at Gateway Seminary. Uh, she is both a, a nurse and a, and a professional uh, counselor. She has the masters and doctorates in both uh, arenas. So we'll be, uh, we'll be offering that. Um, not sure exactly when we'll launch, whether it'll be September or uh, January. Uh, one of the other pastoral concerns, number four, is leading leaders. That includes staff, deacons, elders, volunteers, other people who lead. It is also true that pastors are often viewed in the community as community leaders and will often be called upon to lead um, other people in the community and other groups in the community that may be outside of their own, their own congregation. Leadership, um, organizations and people are often in search of people who give off the vibes that say, uh, this person is a leader and uh, can step into a leadership role. And then the fifth is um, making transition in church and life issues. I understand that we come to a certain place and we're not necessarily on the move, uh, but when a, when a younger person will enter into the ministry, they'll often be looking at several moves in their life. They don't always stay in the same place. And sometimes, sometimes their ministry change, their change of ministry setting will require them moving a long ways away um, or at least to another city, sometimes another state. And of course, in terms of mission work, often another country. Um, you know, when you live in a major metropolitan area and you're, you're doing um, part-time ministry, uh, those moves are not necessarily going to be so dramatic. And you may be able to locate in, in one church and stay there for the um, duration of your ministry. That's always a, a great thing if you can have a long-term ministry in one place. I'm concluding 25 years here in Fresno. That's been very fruitful for me. I was three years in my first pastorate. I was uh, nine years in my second pastorate. Um, I was one year sort of on between the three year and, and one year. And after I'd, I'd had a one year ministry earlier on associate pastor and then three year ministry while I was in college and came in, in to the Bay Area and for a year I was kind of floating around doing uh, ministry in churches and helping to do church plants and, and preaching um, in various places and then settling into a, a nine-year pastorate um, which is still um, I still have ministry to some of those people and then moving to a six and a half year pastorate in San Jose uh, when I received the call to come to Fresno, and, and, and that's been for 25 years. I found that, that 25 years is a, is a good tenure, and one that uh, gives a lot of opportunity for digging in deep in the community and getting to know people. So at this stage of life, making some transitions is, is requiring adjustment uh, as I move from uh, different roles to a, to a kind of a a senior <laughs> advisory uh, role while still doing a uh, part-time pastoring. What are the skills and content that we have to master in order to be effective? Well, the first is learning or strengthening in uh, enhanced practical skills in ministry. We, 
we, they're just skills that we have to, that the only way we can learn them is by doing them and, and repeating them over and over again. And the second is an increased understanding and involvement in pastoral care. And I know I haven't fully defined pastoral care. I think of pastoral care as it's part counseling, it's part spiritual care, it's part advising, it's part listening, it's uh, it's uh, the the love that we give people. It's the it's something that is sometimes intangible, but sometimes it's very tangible, and it comes down to you know the prayers we say and the scriptures we read and the, uh, the, the vocal inflections we use and the way we, uh, the way we present ourselves and the way we make our presence uh, known and when the, the way we enter a room. I think that's especially true in entering a hospital room. When I was um, in Fremont, one of our chaplains was very jovial. He was very friendly, everyone liked him. But he always bounced into a room um, loudly. And as a patient and as a pastor and as an observer, I found that that hasn't always worked to, uh, to jump into a room. I have always felt like it was important for me to enter into a hospital room or a space where people were grieving uh, with a certain amount of quiet and reading the room as I went in. This was especially true, driven home to me uh, as I entered a room one day in the maternity ward. Uh, I was visiting uh, the rooms, uh, room to room, uh, where the new babies had been born. Usually you can go in with a real happy face and congratulate the people. But fortunately, God reminded me of how I should enter a room. And I, I entered uh, quietly and observing. And it was not long before I discovered that the young couple was actually grieving because their baby had, had died. And I was able to establish a long-term relationship with that family so that while they, they did not unite with my church, I became their pastor in that community. They had another child that had a congenital heart condition and had a couple of different surgeries at Stanford while I was there. And Stanford was just across the bay from us and I was able to to go over there and, and minister to them and be with them as their child had surgery and become the family pastor, even though they weren't a part of my church. Um, growing in, number three, growing in conceptual knowledge concerning pastoral ministry and minimum content. So there are certain conceptual things. It's a, there's a great deal of work that's done. This is an academic study that, um, that people specialize in, uh, pastoral care and pastoral ministry. I think I'd already said, I may be stepping back. I think I already talked about the nature of pastoral care. And then the personhood and character of the pastoral person. My friend, Alfred Smoke, S-M-O-A-K, died a number of years ago. He lived to be 85, but he did die. But uh, Smoke, we called him Smokey, and, and Smokey was um, a quintessential pastor. Wherever he was, people looked at him and said, he's pastor. It was just one of those things. He often said, if you cut me, I bleed pastor. Uh, because being a pastor was more about who he was than uh, what he did and what he said. It just rubbed off. It just, uh, he just, he just lived that way. It was, it was a part, it had become a part of his identity. And everybody in the city who knew him, knew him that way. 
he was well known in the community, especially in the various medical establishments and places, the funeral homes and places like that. And then we're going to look at some selected areas of pastoral ministry concerns. So uh, I wonder, um, Brother Claude, who is with us here today, if anybody happens to be watching this later, Claude is our, uh, is our token student, live student tonight. Does this raise any questions or comments from you, any of this? No. Nope. So there you have it. Uh, your uh, virtual teacher, Tom Sims, answered all the questions. <laughs> we got a student on the screen there. I have a student on the screen. Well, I have two. I have this guy that doesn't move down here with his computer. And um, I have you who, do, who does, <laughs> who brings a lot of wisdom to this process. OK, let's talk about the assignments that we're going to be doing. We will have reading assignments and quizzes. We will have participation in practical ministry skill development. We'll have written assignments uh, related to pastoral ministry tasks. And then finally, uh, not finally, there are some more, but we'll have an integration paper dealing with the class experience. I'll explain all these in a minute. And um, And, and add to them. So you'll be expected to develop a conceptual framework for the biblical basis for and the tasks of pastoral ministry and the delivery of pastoral care within the pastoral ministry setting. You'll demonstrate uh, effective growth in the following areas. Uh, appreciation of the role of the pastor. Well, this will require us defining pastor in, uh, we were talking a little bit when uh, the recording began about pastoral internships. And that's simply uh, something that some churches, very large churches will set up usually. Now, don't have to be large, it could be small. I've certainly had a number of interns through the years and trainees that I've worked with where someone will come along and walk, work in a supervised setting to uh, learn uh, practical skills and to practice practical skills in the pastoral role. But, you know, churches uh, have a number of pastoral positions often and pastoral roles. The larger they get, the more they have. Um, sometimes there is a pastor of pastoral care who simply focuses on visitation and counseling ministry. Sometimes there will, a church will call its worship leader a worship pastor. As I was growing up, it was very common for Baptist churches to have a pastoral uh, position called the minister of education. And that person would direct uh, the educational programs of the church, the church training, the discipleship programs, the mission programs, and the, um, and the Sunday school and Bible study program. Uh, there is often a youth pastor and sometimes a children's pastor. There could be a pastor for senior adults. But what differentiates someone who is just a director to someone who is a pastor is their function as a shepherding leader of people. Um, I've worked in structures where we've had pastors of small cell churches. So that person would be usually always, almost always someone who had another job in the community but they were the pastor of 15 or 20 people who were a part of a cell group. Um, the second is the confidence in uh, growth and confidence in performance of pastoral ministry tasks. I remember in my first funeral, I had no confidence whatsoever. 
I did not know if I was going to do it right or wrong or if I was going to blow it. I was, I was pretty nervous. Um, several years prior to that, the first time I ever participated in a funeral, I, I was uh, actually still a teenager and I had been asked to sing for a funeral. And I was nervous about that. And it wasn't in my church. It, was, it wasn't it was someone from my church. It was someone in my grandmother's church who had heard me sing and wanted me to sing something I had never learned before. So I sought out my grandmother's pastor and he gave me some advice that helped me have more confidence. But as we learn these roles and we learn to step into these situations, um, one of the areas we can grow in is confidence. The only way to get confidence is through practice, I think. When it's, uh, you know, when it's, uh, when it involves doing something. We don't, we don't necessarily come across that in the beginning just as a, we don't get it in the beginning. We, we get it through doing things over and over again. Um, in the last year, I hadn't done that many funerals. I, I did one online funeral and I did one uh, where I was called upon uh, to do a funeral for a Hmong uh, young lady um, who had died of COVID. But in a year, I'd only done two. Now, I'm used to doing many a year and uh, they had tapered off significantly. The funeral home just wasn't doing very many live ones. And uh, quite frankly, I have developed a lot of confidence in these things over the years so that if I had to step in at the last minute, no problem. If, if someone said, you know, if I'd gotten an emergency phone call and they say, the pastor of the funeral didn't show up, can you come and do it? I would do it. I wouldn't hesitate. I, I wouldn't feel particularly nervous. I would wing my way through it. I would find out about the family as much as I could and about the deceased. And I, I would do it just because of confidence. Took a year off and I, I had to regroup myself a little bit. It came back to me, but I didn't have quite as much confidence as I had gone into the year having. The third area of affective growth is I think very, very important. And if you don't have this in ministry, it's very difficult to do ministry. And that's compassion for those suffering through crises of various nature. If we don't have compassion, we should probably find something else to do. Because um, it doesn't mean you can't be a preacher, don't have a, a role in ministry of some sort, but the pastoral ministry really has to do with the gentle touch of compassion for people um, that grows out of a, a sincere love for them and an ability to feel some of their pain. And to the extent that we can't feel their pain to imagine what it might like be like to have pain, to touch back to some of our own pain so that we can care. I think that is very, very important and when I was young, I was fortunate in that I was thrust into a ministry where I had a, a lot of older people who were sick. I spent a great deal of time going into the homes of shut-ins and into nursing homes. And this helped to this helped to make up for the fact that I was really young and I hadn't, hadn't suffered that much myself. And uh, just to be around and then to kind of, to, to grow in, in my understanding of, of what people were dealing with. Okay, so let's break down the assignments for this course. I'll just do one slide each. This is something that's done weekly and it's participation. This is where it's hard when there's one uh, person live in the class. Uh, and this is what um, 
you've indicated is, is difficult. And I know it's difficult. Uh, but attendance and participation in course activities are essential to the learning experience. Uh, you've never been tardy yourself, I don't think. Uh, absences, insufficient participation, these are difficult, but uh, this is just, you know, I evaluate this by asking and answering questions and you, you're asking and answering of questions uh, when that opportunity comes. I will treat this class, since I'm recording them all, a little different than uh, an independent study where we're just meeting one-on-one, -on -one, because I will prepare lectures and I will deliver lectures. One thing about having a smaller class is sometimes the lectures go by faster and it doesn't take quite as long to, to give them. So we'll see how that goes. It's not that I'll ever run out of content on this subject, but um, we'll play this by ear. The second uh, area that you'll be graded on is the reading. Now we have uh, the two books that I've assigned. Uh, the book by Jim Wilson, who teaches at Gateway, is a very good book uh, and a very uh, both specific and general on doing ministry. Jim has written a number of books out of his many years of experience as a on the ground pastor before he ever got into um, seminary education. So reading the textbooks, submitting periodic repeat reading reports, best if it's done every week, it just a brief reports on that you read the material and you know anything that stood out. I don't need a complete outline. I have a copy of the book, but um, and then I could I, I may make it easier on you by uh, creating a quiz. I was waiting to see how many people would be live in the class before I made a strong decision on that, but uh, you know how that goes. Um, the second book is the Minister's Service Manual. And you're going to like this book because it is a very practical how-to on uh, how to do a funeral, how to do a wedding, how to... Uh, and, and it has sample worship services. It has sample prayers. It has sample um, guides for church procedures and public worship. It's really a handbook that you can use for the rest of your life and the rest of your ministry. It's something you can keep in your car or on your desk and carry around with you. I've gone through a number of these and those like them throughout my ministry. I even made one up of my own that I use for myself with my own scribbles in it. Uh, a little black book that I would put services in and that sort of thing. And I, for a number of years, I carried it around with me. So that's what this is. I, it's been requested a number of times that I recommend one. And the third reading is, I, I have a link to three versions of the Baptist faith and message. One from um, the early part of the 20th century one from the 1960s, and then one that was revised uh, in the early 2000s. And so we'll do a comparison on that. The third thing is viewing and interacting with recorded lectures. Now that would be if, uh, if you choose to do the uh, 8 a.m. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday uh, as a recording, uh, or if I give something you could do at any time as a recording, but um, I will I will develop some sort of short quiz for each of these. Probably won't have a quiz for tomorrow mornings uh, yet, but uh, we'll do some quizzing on those. And then um, the Baptist Faith and Message Review will use the comparison chart that I referred to. There's a link in the syllabus 
to compare the three editions and write a one to three page reflection noting the five most significant changes that have been made throughout those three editions. Interrupt me if you have any questions about any of these assignments. All right. Again, these, these are all quotes that are coming directly out of the syllabus. And then we're gonna do um, four orders of service and that you'll just submit an order of service like you would to the church secretary to put in the bulletin if you were having one of these services. You'll, each will be a two page, they'll be a little longer because they'll explain what you're doing at each uh, thing. It won't just say morning prayer, it'll explain what that morning prayer is like. But the four services will be a regular Sunday morning worship service bulletin, um, a funeral service where you um, you kind of write down what you're going to do and at any given point, what scriptures you're going to read, where you're going to read them. A, a wedding ceremony that you, I would suggest you write out word for word. And maybe it would help be helpful for you to write out a little shorter version of word for word for the funeral. And then an ordination service where someone is being ordained either to the diaconate or the pastoral ministry. The next is the ministry practice paper. This will be a one to two page uh, paper for each ordinance. So one will be for the Lord's Supper and another for the, uh, for the ordinance of baptism. Um, I have a date on all of these, by the way. This will be due July 19th. It will, it will describe your theological and practical understanding of the ordinance, your ministry experience and anticipation of issues in ministry for baptism and Lord's Supper, how you would do it. And then I think the most rewarding part of the class has been for many people, this assignment. It's also a challenging one, but you develop a 10 question survey and you conduct that survey with three different working pastors or retired pastors, it doesn't matter. Um, the survey will be graded on the creativity and complexity of the questions and your reflection on each interview. You'll submit a report of the three interviews, including the 10 questions and an answer summary from each pastor with a two page reflection of what was learned from each interview. They'll be due July 26. So uh, these interviews are very important. They will give you three different perspectives on, on what to, uh, what different pastors have learned about doing pastoral ministry through the years. Uh, finding those pastors might be challenging, but um, I would say if you if you ran into a ran into a roadblock, you know your own pastor would be one. You could either interview your director of missions or ask your director of missions to recommend. A uh, couple of people to interview. And if worse comes to worse, I'm available to be interviewed. Well, you may already have found out more than you want to know from me. We'll see. And it's hard to find them sometimes. It is. So as you as you set that up, don't let yourself get into a um, don't let yourself get into trouble at the last minute. You ask for help and we'll help find find somebody for you to talk to. And then uh, your final exam will be what we call an integration paper. And that's a five page paper where you integrate the theology, experience and practice of pastoral ministry. And that will be due August 1st. August 1st is after our last class. But I'm gonna give you till then to do that. It's going to include an overview of personal ministry, pastoral ministry concerns. So it's a personal paper, it's about you. 
an evaluation of your own sense of readiness to do pastoral ministry, lessons you've learned from readings and classroom discussions, and a plan to develop ongoing pastoral ministry competence. It's a, this is what I learned in this class paper. So it needs to be more than just a listing of topics. While it's not a research paper, it should uh, demonstrate use of cited resources beyond the syllabus and course presentations. And it will be due, uh, as I said, it'll be due August 1st. And so you'll be able to just um, submit it then. Any question about any of these assignments? No. Okay. So I've already talked about what the texts are, and these are the links that people can use. These are uh, live links if you get into any problem with those. This is our schedule. So what I've done is I've broken it down into weeks. So the main class is, is of course, this three-hour class that we're doing on Monday nights. And then it's followed up by the three, three classes during the week, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And this week, we're looking at pastor's role and relationships. Then we'll move into the pastor as a minister of caring. We will look at pastor as teacher, then pastor as leader, and then two weeks, pastor as worship leader, and then finally, pastor as theologian and public theologian. Uh, you'll notice that I have included the reading that is uh, for those weeks. So if your book comes before the end of the week and you um, can get it done, uh, go ahead and read through chapter six of Wilson uh, for next week, for next Monday night. If, if it doesn't come in time and you're somewhere in the middle, it's okay, you can catch up. But otherwise, those readings are what is to be done before we come to class. But again, we can be flexible based upon, you know, the shipping and all of that. Does that make sense? Oh, well, yeah. Excellent. All right, so then our one hour sessions are really gonna be 50 minutes. 45 or 50 minutes. Um, a lot of sessions. Yeah. So uh, meet um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, or just Tuesday and Thursday? Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So that dash means through, Tuesday through yeah. Thursday. So uh, most weeks there'll be three. We'll have some vacation days. Okay. Uh, but we need to get in 24 hours, 24 of them. Now, um, if it looks like eight o'clock is not working, you know, I'll, you know, I may pre-record these and make them available right now. Like tomorrow, I'll be live. I'll go live and then we'll just assess it. If it's just, if nobody else joins the class, then we can be flexible, but I will record them because uh, there may be people that want to take the class later uh, who are not able to join us live and I can offer it uh, that way. Okay. Okay. So I, I thought I'd show a little video on what pastoral ministry is not. This is just a funny little video. Especially funny if it doesn't work. Which is giving me some trouble. Let's see if I can make it, if I can trick it into working. So I'm going to come over and um, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm going to go back. Um, I do think um, there is a, a misunderstanding sometimes of pastoral Welcome ministry. Welcome to the Boys College Online Church History of One. Live lecture number two for the summer 2016. And that's not what I wanted to show. 
think. That's for tomorrow. Just um, bear with me a moment and I'll get, I'll get you going. Uh, any questions about the class that have come up while we're, uh, while I'm looking for this? Oh, the only thing, uh, you're sending me the stuff with the book, but when I look for the syllabus, right, I didn't, the syllabus, I mean, the books were in the page with the syllabus, so I didn't see the syllabus neither. So I just emailed you the syllabus. Oh, you just did? So that's good. Uh, at the beginning of class. All right. You want to check on that? Uh, let me find something there. Give me a minute. So for those of you who are in syllabus, I, it's a Word document. I think you can also find the syllabus at www.midvalleyschooloftheology.com. Okay. Let me, I'm trying to find my tablet here. I can't find my tablet on my phone. Oh, really? <laughs> That's unusual. Well, that happens sometimes. I know you sent it, so. Well, what are you, uh, what are you uh, logging in with right now if it's not your phone or your tablet? Um, my Chromebook. Oh, okay. So. I found the phone. Okay. Well, your Chromebook has email on it. Yeah. So if you're watching this on a delayed feed, um, this is the sort of thing that happens in class. It's just, um, you know, that's just the nature of, of class. We, we get, um, I have technical problems and students have technical problems and we just work through them. And, and sometimes we have pauses and sometimes we don't. And um, I have found the thing that I wanna share. Celebrity. You sent me a Zoom link and you sent me that, uh, I got the syllabus thing now. Okay. Very good. Okay, let me go back to sharing my screen again. And uh, all right. Can you see my screen? Oh, yeah. Okay, so For some reason, welcome to the Boys College the Online. Wrong place. So your your question on um, your question regarded the syllabus. So you, now that you have it in front of you, uh, do you know what it is? Oh, the syllabus back in front of me again. Yeah, I got to open it back up again. Well, yeah, only if you had a question on it. Oh no no no. I don't need, I don't have a question on it. Well, I tell you what, I'm having a hard time playing that video, and it was just fun, and just for fun. And since uh, I'm not getting anywhere with it, I'm going to go on. Um, and we'll we'll add it some other time. There are three. Um, there are three words that are used for pastor in the New Testament. One of those words is poimen. Um, poimen is um, is a word is just the word for shepherd. Shepherd. Very common. It's a noun. It's masculine. Uh, trend, and by the way, um, nouns in Greek are either masculine or feminine. They have nothing to do with anything 
except that, that a noun has to be masculine or fem feminine uh, in most cases. Um, and it's, it doesn't mean, it, it's not to be used as an argument for, uh, for or against um, gender in ministry. Uh, the phonetic spelling would be poimain, and so I, I said poimen, but it's poimain is how you would pronounce it. And its usage in the Greek was literally for shepherd, somebody who takes care of sheep, and hence it meant the feeder, the protector, and the ruler of a flock of people. So the church is the flock of God and the local congregation is a local flock of God. And God appoints under shepherds, pastors to lead, to care for, to meet the needs, to protect spiritually uh, those uh, flocks. So it's a very beautiful, um, beauty, beautiful, designation of the role of a person who is a leader of a church. When I was in San Jose, there was an empty field between us and a little strip mall. I'd walk across that field from our church building two or three times a day. One time I would go over to get myself a bottle of Jarito, uh, which is a, you know, a Mexican um, soft drink, very delicious, very sugary, very bad for you. I'd drink about two of those a day when I was in San Jose, get them from this little Mexican restaurant. My friend Jose, I, I, I made friends with him. Well, at least once a day, I would go over and get my favorite burrito from him, which was Al Pastor. And he would say, Okay, pastor, you want to eat yourself again today? <laughs> when I would order al pastor. Um, so uh, it wasn't really sh lamb, but they used the same word uh, that is uh, sheep and shepherd um, for that meat. The second word is presbyteros. Presbyteros. Uh, it means elder. Um, it's an adjective, but it can it also, it can take the form of a noun. Um, it's the word from which we get presbytery or presbyterian. And it is used in the church and in the New Testament to designate an elder. Uh, a, but in Judaism, it would also be a member of the Sanhedrin, was an elder, or the elder of a Christian assembly. And so it is a leadership term. So there is um, this sense in the New Testament of a pastor as a leader. The next word is episkopos. And it is superintendent or overseer, a masculine noun, someone who is uh, superintendent, supervisor, overseer. Um, it was an official title in civil life. It is someone who is kind of the boss, but kind of watches over other bosses sometimes. It's, it's a leader and it becomes used more and more as a supervising function uh, that is exercised by the elder or presbyter of the church. And it is also the basis of the, uh, the word that we use for the Episcopal church. That, um, and it's also uh, an English version of the episcopos is bishop. So when we say that someone is a bishop, we're saying that they are an overseer. And in those churches that have bishops that are assigned to uh, oversight of multiple churches and clergy, 
they um, it means that they're they they have a function of overseeing 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 um, other pastors and um, and or churches. Of course, in, in Baptist life, uh, if someone's called a bishop, it doesn't mean that they're the boss of another pastor or the boss of another church. Just the title. Usually, I'm sorry? It's just the title. It's just the title. They usually use it, and especially in African-American churches, it's used to refer to your mentor. He's my bishop really means, as I understand it, you may understand this better than me, he's my mentor. He's the person I call when I need good advice. <laughs> and we know we all need people like that in our lives. Um, but yeah, we don't have a, we don't have that as an official designation in Southern Baptist life anyway, as a role. But I know that when I was uh, a director of missions, that was the I said that's the closest thing we have to a bishop with no power, <laughs> with no authority. <laughs> so one of the guys that worked at the convention would come in. Whenever he come into my office and sit down and want to chat about church planting, because that was his field, he said, well, how's the bishop today? I say, yeah, still no authority. <laughs> still, still nothing but making suggestions. So Wilson will tell us in the first chapter of pastoral ministry in the real world, he'll point out to us that there are three main qualifications, and I'll let you read that for yourself, for a pastoral minister. One is a stable lifestyle. That is, uh, your lifestyle is one that it can exemplify Christ it's not so topsy-turvy that you don't have time to put it, you know, put the practice, put the stuff to practice. You don't, you're not overly distracted by the cares of this world. It doesn't mean you're not busy, but your life is not in a, in chaos. And uh, that's why there are so many things about, you know, your family is in order and you know, it sounds like, Sounds like Paul's being a busybody sometimes, but he's not. He, he knows that a stable spiritual and mental and emotional and relational life is key, not only as a role model and an, exemplar, an exemplary model of how Christ can bring order to a a man's life, but also as um, for the health of the church and the health of the pastor. I have known pastors who had severe problems with jealousy, you know, of other, other ministers or other people in their church uh, with feeling threatened or with feeling, um, feeling that everybody was out to get them or you know, they just, they had a hard time establishing relationships. Sometimes they would have a hard time looking someone in the eye. And um, it didn't lend itself to a, a, a level of trust. Or they would have, you know, knock down, drag out fights with their spouses or their kids right in the middle of church, you know. And that's not to say that a pastor's home life is ever going to be perfect. But, you know, you do learn a certain amount of compartmentalization. Um, so some sort of stability in life. Um, the second is above reproach. This has to do with a pastor's ethics, honesty, morality. We've talked a lot about this in other classes. Um, 
how much discredit it can bring to the ministry if um, a pastor has areas of severe moral or ethical failure, um, especially uh, with regard to um, especially with regard to uh, sexual relations or sexual harassment. Uh, or violence, or uh, misuse of power. Um, I know one pastor in this community says that one of the secrets of success was he never touched the church's money or the church's women, <laughs> or any other <laughs> except his wife. Um, and then the ability to teach and a willingness to teach. Uh, and to do teaching through preaching and through lifestyle and mentoring. Um, so I, I leave it to you to read more detail on that and more of the biblical basis of all of that. There are verses to back all of that up. And uh, Jim Wilson does a really good job of citing those. Yeah. In I've, seen, I've seen all these happen in my church, especially the stable life. You know, people come there with chips on their shoulder from having a bad relationship from where they came. Yeah. And they want to show the people where they, they left that they were better than that. And it just brings them down more. Sure. That's right. And they never hardly ever teach. Right. <laughs> well, there you go. So when God calls a, a person to be a pastor, these are three, three areas that will be manifest, I think. And it's up to the church to, to evaluate these and to discern these in a person's life. Now, I did put down um, the meeting and the passcode. I emailed you the passcode for subsequent meetings. Um, Here's the thing, I, I, I prepared this you know, believing that we'd have four or five people in here and there'd be a lot of questions and discussion. <laughs> that's, that's the plot of this being by yourself. I know, so I did, yeah. this is all I've got, but I do have this wonderful, um, if it will play. But the design for, you know, like three or four people or more. Yep, well, it won't play. And um, I know what to do in the future to make sure my videos are embedded and will play. Well, so, I'll go watch it later. I'll give them to you for later. And um, I'll give them to you and, and I'll, I'll probably have them for you tomorrow morning. Like uh, I said, I prepared for this. It just, it's so much longer when it's one person, but I prepared for this. It's a lot shorter when it's one person. <laughs> it just seems longer. <laughs> But yeah, we'll, um, we'll take this up in the morning uh, if that works for you. And we will, um, I, will, I will know now how to structure things a little more effectively. I'll give it some thought. I'm going to actually try and uh, look at one of these things that you recorded. But sometimes I get them, sometimes I can't. But I'm on, is it going to be in uh, Google Classroom? Uh, I was going to set up Google Classroom, but I didn't. I set up. I'm. I've got. To, I'm going to have everything on uh, in a website. Okay. So um, I will. I won't get it. I won't get them in there tonight. I don't think. But I will get them in there, so you can watch them. You won't lose anything. I will make sure that everything. Um, gets to you and uh that will that will bring us up to the three hours for tonight and then so eight o'clock in the morning good for you oh yeah all and right i guess it's gonna go from eight to like uh nine right or something you said that'll be before nine it's about eight fifty. yeah and and your My wife likes to go walking with her now. What time she like to so walk? I'll see you then. Huh? 
Huh? What time does she like to walk? Oh, I would say about 10 30 or 11. Oh yeah, you'll be fine. Yeah. Well, I have I have a um I have a mentoring client at nine o'clock, so I will be done by then. Oh, okay then. So I'll check with you, Pastor Tom. Okay, I'll see you. I'll see you online. All right then. Bye bye.